Hello and welcome, and we're here at Holistic Investments, and I'm excited to have another amazing guest with us, Alexander Salnikov. He's a co-founder and chief strategy officer at Rarible. Um, hi, Alex. Really good to hear you. Hi, Constantine. Yeah, it's really great to hear you as well. Thank you for having me. Yes, great to hear you. Great to have you. And obviously, we're going to talk about NFT marketplace. Rarible, as you know, is one of the top you know, like uh, NFT marketplaces in the world. It has a tremendous story of four years of, you know, they're building like one of the most user-friendly Web3 products. I'm a user myself. So, you know, I definitely know uh, that people are happy with the platform. They basically uh, sold more than $300 million worth of NFTs, you know, like in various domains. We're going to talk about it today. Of more than a million users, you know, like a lot of social media followers and, um, a lot of integrated marketplaces, right? I, as I as I assume it's white labeled. So we're going to talk about all these exciting things. But before, traditionally, we have to make sure we're legal and compliant. So I have to throw legal disclaimer that this content is for informational purposes only. We should not construe uh, any of such information as material, uh, legal, tax, investment, financial, or any other advice. Now, Alex, the floor to you. First, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get into the crypto rabbit hole and what inspired you later to get and start Rarible? I'm originally from a small town in Russia. And when I was growing up, I remember one of the feelings that I had always with me that I was extremely bored. So pretty early in my life, I started thinking about like how do I how do I work online? I was like, what do I do? I started experimenting. Uh, I remember maybe in like tenth grade in in school, I was creating a website. I had an idea that we should replace the traditional, you know, like advertising board. You know, every small town has this place where everybody just sticks their ads on the wall and like I'm I, I'm selling a dog I'm buying a dog that kind of things and I'm like why don't we make that online and I created a board and then I realized nobody cares the town is so small it's impossible to penetrate it at all and then I created a website for our own school and that later turned to be like in information purposes they used it for uh, some reporting to the what's the school ministry or whatever is there so I, I i had many ideas and i was a copywriter and one of the things that i noticed is for the person who is under 18 and especially even after i turned 18 every online platform that exists for accepting money was asking me for a passport okay uh on board get through the KYC and then, oh okay, your country is no good for our service. I was so bummed about this and it was so hard to accept money online. And then when I started uh, in my education in university, computer science, my whole family is mathematicians and academia, I was discovered, I discovered crypto. Uh, my friend told me about it. Um, I did a viral project in the university if you remember the social media social network movie when there was a website when you needed to choose one of two girls like which one is cooler and i, I created the same one for our university it went viral through the roof in one day like twenty thousand people participated there i i was threatened to be kicked out of school for this but it went viral and i met a lot of great people from my university and one of the guys approached me and said he seems to be a cool guy let's build a business together you, you tech savvy let's do something cool here's bitcoin and you can do the exchange with bitcoin let's just do it i was like that's cool and i read the bitcoin white paper and and that clicked just instantly i'm a computer science student myself by background and there is the new money global borderless I can accept it without passport. All my, all my problems are solved. And more importantly, this is the money that is created by tech people and not by economy people. And I felt, I felt proud for for profession more or less for for being tech person that can reinvent the money. And 
since then I never left the space. That was in 2012. I never had like a web two job. All my jobs were web three and all of them were startups. At some point we calculated that we have 10 startups that were named. There was a pitch deck created, the branding created that died at various stages. Some of them raised money, some of them not raised money. There was a lot of experimentation happening and that all led to Rarible starting in 2019 when I already had some seven years of experience. Usually people get their experience on their traditional jobs, but the first startups that we did were just a disaster just based on the execution. It's so hard to execute if you don't know what you're doing. So I was learning seven years how to work and then Rarible happened. First of all, I really appreciate your humility, um, re openly talking about like things that are not sexy, you know, like a lot of people think, oh, there is like a successful company, this is overnight success, you know, like the young Zuckerberg, and then the reality is, which is more common, by the way, the story that you're sharing, I have very similar story, you think I started in 2012, and I also had a lot of like, unsuccessful attempts. And you know, you're just sharing openly that guess what? There is multiple, like in the dumpster of the startups that failed, right? And instead of going and say, oh my God, like what a disaster, now I have to go back to work, you went on and continued to persevere and to start your entrepreneurial journey, right? And eventually you found yourself with Rarible, right? So this by itself, you know, um, I think should for anyone who's listening like this, this by itself is very admirable right i should say like i i respect you for what you did so far um now let's 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 get back a little bit so you were you know data science like you had a background of product management you understood how to build systems also because you were coding yourself and you have math major right um talk a little bit about like your team right how did you meet your co-founders what inspired you guys in the first place to start rarible during that years of unsuccessful building, uh, I met our designer, our head of design, Ilya. He's great. He's created one of the logos for one of the startups. And he was showing it to us, to me and my partner. And I I'm, I'm afraid you might not like this. He said it before showing. And I'm like, why is that? And he was like, you you'll see. And he shows us an absolutely minimal Apple style thing that is like almost no design, right? And and he was afraid that we are some kind of boomers that would not appreciate that. Uh, and I was like, this is amazing. I love it. It's great. Since then, basically, we've been working together on all the projects. Uh, so that, that was very nice. I met my co-founder, Alexei, who is the CEO and I've been doing most of the product side and he is doing like everything uh, from the CEO perspective. We met in 2017 uh, during the previous bull run. We were working on the projects together. Uh, there was a project for issuance ERC-20 tokens. Uh, back then that was a profitable business. Everybody was issuing their tokens. That was a blast. And then the specific moment when uh, we, we were more like a colleagues uh, back then, um, mm, after the bull run, I had some money earned. I took half a year to a year off from my work. That was nice, <laughs> super beneficial, tremendous benefit for my health. I, I was, I, I started doing sports. I quit smoking. I quit computer games. I was going through this phase of like dopamine detox after the bull run. Very, very important. And pretty much half a year, I, I set myself that the cheapest dopamine I can get is reading books. That was that was the cheapest one. So no no TVs, no no movies, even um, almost no music. And I got super bored again. That that feeling from my childhood that I'm super bored and I'm basically saying yes to anything that people offer to me. They say, "Let's go on a weekend to this distant place." I'm like, "Yes, I'm in. Sure, let's go." It. Let's go to that country to talk to that investors. Let's do it again. Yes, I'm in. Do, do you remember there was a movie, Yes Man, with Jim Carrey, right? So... That was me. That was me on Dopamine Detox. You become a yes man. I finished. I took driver, driving license. I finished my university because in 2017, during the bull run, I, I took the uh, 
like what's ac- academic leave from the university as they call it yeah sabbatical. i got back to school sabbatical i finished that i did a lot of things uh, i got my us visa and moved to the united states pretty much uh all the things are a result of the half a year dopamine detox highly recommend to everyone who wants to do something different in their lives um very beneficial mm, so anyway during the peak of the bull run there was so much crap happening in the space every time every day you had news about new project that's launching their own blockchain is going to revolutionize something and at some point, I even stopped reading the crypto news because they were all almost like wrong. There was like empty promises here and there all the time. But then in the bear market, everybody stopped to be quiet. Everybody starts started to be quiet. And I, I was bored. I started reading a lot about the space again. And I discovered that this Ethereum ecosystem advanced so much. In 2017, you needed to download the Mist wallet wait for the network to synchronize spend 200 gigabytes of space on your uh, laptop that was insane for the consumer to to reach the space but in the bear market there was okay metamask you could top up your crypto wallet with even apple pay with wire you could connect your wallet to dApps with wallet connect you could take a loan on compound so a compound was pretty magical. I tried, okay, I have some ease. I can take some USD and I can not sell my ease. And while doing that, I realized that it is actually feasible for a consumer to go through this path. You can see your wallet and that feels like you own the things, all the Web3 ethos of decentralized ownership of the sovereign identity was there. And we thought, okay, what? what is going to be the next step with applications? What are going to be spiked? We assembled a group of five people and started brainstorming. So the variable idea was pretty much born in one day. I started shooting these articles uh, before, like before that day. I started shooting these articles about something interesting happens with the space to all my friends. Like, hey, take a look at that. Hey, hey, take a look at this. And and my co-founder, Alexei, he was responsive. He was responding to me, oh, that's cool. That's interesting. That's great. So he was engaging. And that's pretty much how we all get together. There was DeFi and NFTs. There was no other things in the crypto. Either you do a DeFi project or you do an NFT project. NFT was much younger and it was much more appealing to consumers, to the mass adoption. And I can actually feel the same right now that with the advent of L2 and custodial wallets, we're going to see one more cycle of consumer adoption next bull run with socials with friend tech with all the things that are happening right now but that was the same feeling but on the smaller scale that something is about to happen that's when we decided to launch wearable now fast forward this four years you know since 2019 a lot things happened we had nft spring so to speak in 2021 and maybe a little bit of 2022 early but like mostly 2021 and now we have slowly we're getting out of the winter so to speak as as, as opposed to i would say the traditional seasons crypto has its own cycles <laughs> so my question to you is like how do you foresee nft arena right now um we definitely have to be probably very transparent about the fact that like the secondary market is a disaster right now like this is probably what 97 percent, 98 percent drop so there are people who are naturally very skeptical right about the utilities about the the entire atmosphere right but there are people like yourself who are builders right who don't care about the cycles who go and deliver and have a long-term vision so can you share with us a little bit of this positivity like what do you see that others have to pinpoint and pay attention to i think exactly what you mentioned is happening a lot of people were upset about utility they basically had the mini bubble board a for five hundred thousand dollars okay that's cool uh there is still a lot of a lot of value into this we just had the twitter space with luca nets from pudgy penguins pudgy penguins um costs five ETH today that is ten thousand dollars pretty much it's still a high check but this 
PFPs, they're going to the route of becoming the IP route, of becoming the IP rights um, recorded on chain. Mm -hmm. So they are selling toys, $25 each toy in Walmart, in Amazon, but they're deriving this toy IP from this main collection. And the main collection holders receive money of the sales, the royalty. So pretty much it, you can think of PFPs as if the Mickey Mouse IP was recorded on chain. How much does the Mickey Mouse IP cost? It costs a lot. But we had a bubble of that. And the utility for this is there. We've seen pretty much two utilities, art and PFP. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Now we see a lot of innovation. We see gaming NFTs that are happening. We're seeing token bound accounts when NFT can own the wallet. And in that wallet, you can own other NFTs or cryptocurrencies, ERC20 tokens attached to the NFT. We're seeing dynamic NFT that can change their metadata that can evolve on chain with some actions. We see soul bound, we see pow ups. So there is just a large variety of the new use NFT use cases that is being built. And we, with the advent of layer twos and, and the lower gas prices, we're seeing the check sizes that are going way down. We work with brands, traditional brands that are entering the space, Mattel, McFarlane toys. They are entering the space and they're selling digital toys for people at pretty much the same prices, 50 bucks, 70 bucks. And there is massive audience that still enjoys this core value prop of I own things digitally. Mm -hmm. When you own things in your wallet, when you can switch your wallet, when you can switch a marketplace, when you don't feel vendor locked, when you don't feel dependent, that feels like it is yours. And if it's yours, you get a dopamine hit and you already spent money to get that. So let's talk about, you mentioned about a very interesting utility. So I want to talk about like non-speculative use cases, right? The more, uh, I mean, we've heard and we've seen, obviously, the the board aid pop of the or the crypto punks, which is, by the way, still, you cannot even buy them. They're not for sale, right? You know, so there is this memorabilia and one of those early movers, you know, like that are still, I would say, in a good shape, relatively in a good shape. And there are others, right? So... Um, which new utilities, uh, have you seen, you can name top three, which you consider are not only exciting, but also they make sense as a utility of NFT. I think the biggest emerging, it is kind of derived from PFPs, but this is the digital character, your digital identity. It is, it has relations to this token bound things. Your digital identity can own other things, but we're seeing things like Lens, social network where every profile is an NFT and this profile can own the domain name and other NFTs and posts. So your, your digital identity, we're seeing games and the games usually use NFTs for character too. So your, your digital identity, your character would probably be number one. Outside of this, there's interesting experiments with blog posts. Mirror is the great example of non-speculative use case. You just come there and you can claim, you can collect the blog post and have it in your collection. I'm sitting right there in the office with the amazing guy who is building the app where you can browse things that you own and you can categorize them. Okay, here's all the NFTs that I own that I can read. And there is a reader button attached to it and you can read the whole article right inside the wallet or all the NFTs that I can listen to. So he is subscribed to three top podcasts for crypto and he listens, he claims them when they go out, when they're released, he claims those NFT podcasts and he listens them through his app on the go. So amazing use cases. Media, that would be number two. And then yes. number three is, I think that is getting harder, membership, I think. When the NFT gives you access to something. When the NFT gives you access to the event, when the NFT gives you access to some online experience, that is probably the biggest one, the third one. Yeah. And actually, our product like that we launched was this exactly the third option. It was access to particular um, you know, investment club and deals, you know, that's membership style. Um, let me ask you differently, right? You know, there's um those are obviously amazing examples, right? But 
Um, we have to address probably one of the biggest influencer in the world, uh, Elon Musk. We recently, like on Joe Rogan podcast, I'm her. I'm sure you've heard this. Like you know, he made fun of NFTs, calling them that like some of them are just JPEGs, which are not even on blockchain, right? So they're not. You know, if the company goes out of business, the the JPEGs will cease to exist, right? I want you to either comment or debunk the myth, so that like for the audience, like you know, they understand it a little bit deeper. So the way NFTs work on the technical level, you have some part of the data that is recorded on chain and some part of the data that exists off chain. And the reality is that NFT, the number, the actual ownership of that item is recorded on chain. And there is metadata, which includes image, text, description, everything else recorded off chain. Now there is different ways to record that off chain. One of the ways would be to put that on the just regular centralized server. You can put this on your own server and you can serve this metadata. And now this will go down. Although because it is immutable, it's always the same. When the NFT is released, it will actually be downloaded and saved with variable, with OpenSea, with the many guys. So it's not going to be lost, but that's the most dangerous way of storing the NFTs. The second one, and the, the most popular of them, is storing this in IPFS. IPFS stands for Interplanetary File System. This is decentralized file storage where that lo- works like a torrent. There are people that are serving the data. There, is, there can be 5,500 different peers that has this data copy, and they're serving this data. And this data is hashed. So you are absolutely sure that it didn't change and it can come from any of the things. So if you're a creator, you can even host your own data on yourself in the IPFS and you can make sure that this is not going away. Now, IPFS is safe, relatively safe. I mean, not relatively. It's not as the same as building it on a blockchain, but it is very safe in the sense of file coin. They came with initiative and they backed up all the NFTs that are recorded on IPFS. And now they're one of the servers forever for these NFTs. There are different ways of storing that. There is RV, but majority of NFTs are held on are held on IPFS. And I consider this to be safe for the space. Now, if we're talking about like a founder, right? You know, a project that actually issued 10,000 pieces, right? Unique. You know, PFP, 10,000 pieces, which is a very popular model in 2021, right? Now, what would happen? Let's let's talk about the risk management so that anyone who is like still new to the NFT space, they understand the risk. What happens if, God forbid, let's say somebody is forgetting to pay like a, so for the subscription, right, of the servers? Because some of them are actually still run on subscriptions, right? At those IPFS, you have to also maintain, maintain the nodes and like, you know, you have to somehow make sure the infrastructure is there. What are the outcomes and how do you prevent that? Like, like God forbid, something happens with founders and then the project, you know, becomes like obsolete. For the IPFS, there is multiple things that automatically happens. So if you're posting something on IPFS, at least, at the very least, that will be saved by the multiple other nodes that are serving this content. So in theory, I released my 10,000 NFTs and I just do nothing. And there is probably a 90% chance that this is going to be hosted just automatically by their automatic redistribution of this content with APFS. If you want to be sure, probably even more than 90, I would say 98%. If you want to be super sure, you need to use the pinning service. It is some paid customer, it's some paid business that you need to pay for that will pin. That means they will become the server of this content on IPFS. We are pinning every NFTs that we know on our nodes. Other crypto projects like OpenSea again and others will pin that as well and Filecoin. So if you're a founder, you probably want to make sure that you still pay for something pinning. Otherwise, there is a risk that it will go away. Yeah. Now, let's talk about other aspects. How can you protect your assets, right? You know, for example, 
like you mentioned, there are now more sophisticated uh, toolkits, right? Where you can actually loan money against your NFT, right? Or you can even sometimes insure your NFT. All of these like tools are not very like familiar to people who never tried them on. So maybe you can recommend some of the best tools that you personally use or you partner with. Yeah. I don't actually use too many loan services. <laughs> I am a consumer of NFTs in the sense of just the real digital consumer. When I buy things, I just want to own them. I own not even that many super expensive NFTs that can be loaned against, but this is very, very widespread with the trading audience. So if you want, I think the best tool today would be Blur. If you want to loan your NFT and get some money for it, Uh, that actually works the other way around on Blur. Yeah. On Blur, you are getting, uh, you can borrow the uh, the money to buy an NFT. So you can lend other people your spare money. Uh, there is NFTFi, Arcade, BandDAO are the best services in the lending in the lending space. Mm -hmm. Now, do you do you see other important tools that? like probably like haven't developed yet, but you think that the natural progression and evolution of the industry is going to this direction. And maybe you can identify some of those that you can foresee in the coming one or two years, they're gonna appear in the market. NFTs are taking two routes today. One of them is exchange route. You can see that many of the prominent NFT marketplaces, if you go to them, you see not the items even themselves, but you see charts. You see the growing chart or falling chart because a lot of people love to trade. Yes. But that's one route. It is IP. There will be loans. There will be options. There will be everything. There will be indexes. Everything we know, all the sophisticated instruments, perpetual swaps, all there will be applied to NFTs. And that's unstoppable. That will happen. And there is another route, which is e-commerce route. When you consider NFTs to be digital products, where people can buy, serve. Um, in that area, I think the two important things that are happening right now is the discovery apps. There is multiple ap applications appear right now because there is just too many NFTs. If you go to marketplace that allows you to search an NFT, you don't know what to search for. So there is multiple applications that allow you to discover, that allow you to follow people, to understand what they're buying, to ape into the same things that the other people are buying. So, and the second big thing that is happening today is social. And can you, sorry, not to jump into this second part, like, can you recommend one of those like aggregators or tools that you mentioned that are great for discovery? One of the app is called Interface. And the second app is called Soho, S-O-H-O. Mm -hmm. So this is two leading apps that I think are cool for discovery. Mm -hmm. There is also a very nice discovery mechanism on the forecaster, which is going to the second uh, answer about cool things are happening. It is actually a social network built with NFTs. Um, but because there is a following base on forecaster, there is actually the activity tab. You can go there and you'll see a lot of things that other people are doing. So it's pretty cool for discovery as well. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they, they work to get interface and forecaster. They work together. The same team that created it, right? I'm not sure. No, I think this, I'm pretty sure it's two different teams. Oh yeah. Interesting. So maybe they partner. Yeah. Cause I remember I actually found forecaster through interface. So that's why I, I remember the user flow, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Interface team is in Lisbon. Great, great city for web three right now. And uh, Farcaster is just straight up Silicon Valley team. So those are the decentralized social apps in a way, right? You know, they help you just like find, you know, also like something unique. And this is like one of their tools and uh, uh, build huge community. And they allow you to uh, to work together with other like with other people, like to actually see and identify which one is more um popular and and there are multiple criteria so i want to also like as a person who went through i'm sure 
a lot of like things listing collections which sometimes i mean can jeopardize somebody copyrights right so or some other challenging situations like on a legal and compliance term that are not very sexy to talk about right but i maybe you can help to understand how to identify that let's say somebody's claiming that they have affiliation to a, a top celebrity or a piece of art that is very expensive right how do you even make sure that okay this appears in rareable and where do you have to find information that this is actually a legit collection and make sure that you know you don't make a mistake investing a large sum of money into something that is not legit yeah there's no easy answer for this uh blockchain allows you to identify the provenance the history of things uh, but it doesn't allow you to see the passport of the person who produced it, right? So we've been solving this issue for some time. We have our own verified like yellow check mark when people apply. Can it be verified and wearable? That is one source of the information. OpenSea can, has. Can, yes. can you clarify what do you actually verify when you provide this check mark? We verify the identity, right? So we don't verify this is the great art versus not great art. But we request people to submit their social network, social links uh, to us, and we verify the digital identity. We don't ask for the passport. Many people don't want to disclose their identity, but we verify that this is the legitimate online account uh, that is advertising these things, and it is linked to that linked to that NFT. So the identity of a person who is listing this collection or an NFT. Yeah. Okay. Now how let's imagine i want to go and list like you know i don't know paris hilton nft and claim that i have rights to do so right so what are the risk management tools that you apply to make sure that you as a company wouldn't have like you know, any challenges of breaching copyrights yeah we follow the same rules as social media companies rule mm -hmm. uh, follow we rely on the post moderation you are fully allowed to release anything you want, even copies of other things. But then if people flag that this is fake, we would investigate and we would delist things that are fake. So that's pretty much an open field. And you can create an Instagram of Paris Hilter tomorrow. And when you'll start to earn followers, somebody will report you and you'll get delisted. That's pretty much the same, the same risk management that we use. Got it. What about the privacy and data protection laws? You know, um, you're, you just follow the general framework of EU and like, you know, and the uh, US and all other jurisdictions or anything else people have to know about? All the same rules. Yeah. Got it. Um, let's talk about a little bit about security though, so that we cover all the non-sexy topics, but people actually understand like how robust your platform is and why is it actually one of the top marketplaces in the world what what best practices you actually use to make sure that there's no cyber hacking and you know stealing of the customer assets there is not so much different in web 2 and web 3 worlds as well so there is best practices the only thing that web 3 is diff the only place where web3 is different from web2 would be security audits of your smart contracts mm -hmm. so we undergo security audits of different firms that take a look at our open source published contracts and they try to identify the issues with that sometimes they flag oh there is minor issue there here and there we haven't had any security vulnerability even reported to us so they were safe from the get-go and on the back end and the front end it's also fairly common to use the um, bounty programs to so hacker one and i think there are a couple others uh, i don't remember the names but you can register there so the thing is it's just expensive to so register there you say okay we have fifty thousand dollars budget for this security vulnerability of the top tier and then 10,000 for the tier two and then 1,000 for the tier three, something along those lines and, and thousands of security researchers that are ethical white hackers, research your platform and report vulnerabilities to you. Mm -hmm. So Apple does the same, but they pay millions 
for their top tier vulnerabilities. Everybody does it. It is, there is no simple answer there. You just pay people, right, to do the job. Yes. Now, um, talking about like some other other exciting parts, like, you know, for now, as I understand, one of the top four uh, blockchains are for you is Ethereum, Polygon, Tezos, and Immutable X, right? Um, any other plans to integrate more chains and any reason, for example, like why, you know, at some point Solana was pretty popular, Cardano was pretty popular with NFTs. Any reason why you're not incorporating them for now? We actually had Solana for some time on Variable Life. We also have Flow, which yes. is available with our white label marketplace services. Uh, the Mattel, our biggest client, is building on Flow. No gas prices, no nonsense like that. That's very important for them. So in order of things to expect for, we will for sure support all the important layer twos that are coming on. So this is a given. This is where the space is moving. You're supporting that. Um, Arbitrum, Optimism, Base, Ziggy Sync are the top players in the space. When we will support them is a question mark. We are prioritizing based on the NFT activities that are happening on the chain, but also uh, these chains sometimes pay for the integrations, right? So uh, we just received a grant from Arbitrum through their public governance for integrating. So Arbitrum is coming for sure. Uh, that is that is the given, and about others I won't tell you yet. But uh, it, it will all they will all come eventually. This is all about EVM chains that are resembling Ethereum uh, ecosystem, Ethereum virtual machine. With non EVM, it's much harder. So it takes us several months to integrate non EVM chain because the stack is just too complex. Rarible, when it comes to the chain, it indexes all NFTs that exist on this chain. So when we come to Flow, or when we come to Tezos, or when we come to Polygon, we know all the Polygon items that were ever created and were ever transferred from one account to another, and we maintain that index. And this takes a lot of time to develop this. Well, Tezos is also non-EVM, so that's, that's yeah. still... I'm sure it, it took you a lot of time to integrate them, as I assume. Yeah. There's a Solana and Flow where our uh, we, we probably as the marketplace support more most non EVM chains than any other marketplace, and that is for a reason. Got um, it. I, I know you have a, a other exciting like tool that like for people who are like first discovering you, um, they might enjoy it. Like those are drops, right? It's a new feature where you can mint for free. And there's thousands of people are minting like, you know, uh, first time NFT, sometimes they can get royalty, sometimes sometimes they can have like a like a free, uh, awesome, like piece of collection that will actually cost, you know, maybe a lot of money, maybe nothing, we don't know, but like, potentially, you can have a pretty interesting value, right? Can you talk a little bit about it? Yes, um, that would be piggybacking on what you said. The secondary volumes are down 90%, but we're seeing a lot of energy in the primary markets. There is a lot of people that create new NFTs. They mint. Uh, open editions are extremely popular. That's the hottest thing of the season. You release an item and anybody can come during the certain time period and claim that NFT either for free or for very low cost. And some of the popular collections like Opepen was an open edition at some point. So, and that now costs a lot of money. Mm, and pretty much for that, we created this drop section. So if you know, if you've been using Rarible for some time, this is actually a paradigm shift in how the minting works. Before you needed to come to Rarible, you needed to mint all the NFTs yourself as a creator and put them on sale and people would come and buy. Now, the new paradigm is creator only deploys contract and then all the people that are coming, they're minting NFTs and NFTs appear on chain. They get created only when the buyer clicked that button and paid some money. So. That allows us to incorporate cooler minting mechanics. The whole space is built about emotions and curiosity. So oftentimes you don't even know what you're getting. You click the button and you get a random item, one of a hundred, one of 10,000. Um, 
I think the whole PFP collection capitalized on that a lot. The whole PFP movement capitalized on that a lot when you didn't know where you're getting golden ape or a regular ape. Um, Mattel uses uh, randomized drops. You, you get a pack and then you unpack uh, a pack of NFTs and you get five of them with different rarities. That's also a new paradigm. So these drop sections, it is exactly for this. It features all the new drops made in new paradigm when you can come and mint one item that will be just printed uh, to you right there. Um, and we'll add self-service tools so that creators, right now we are deploying this contract, but later down the road, creators would be able to come and create this, de deploy this contract themselves. That's actually exciting news. I agree. That might be very interesting and, and cheaper solutions, right? Uh, also avoiding a lot of like flooding the market with useless like number of NFTs that are just like there and they're just, like a dead weight that you can yeah. only mint when there is actual demand for a particular yeah. collection. I think it's very smart. Um, now I think we organically can talk about like your new product, which we talked, you know, like <laughs> offline a little bit, like a Rarible X. I know literally we're talking with you as you've just announced the new product. So uh, instead of me telling people like how awesome it is and how you can create a custom Web3 marketplace and like, actually do it with your brand, right? I, I would prefer you kind of explain the audience about it. There's many ways to explore that, but um, coming back to what I earlier said, the core tech of Rarible is an indexing tool. When we come to the chain, we instantly know everything about all NFTs that exist on this chain. And this is pretty hard to build. There is maybe 20 companies in the whole NFT space that have their own in-house indexers. So this is defensible, cool, big tech that is mm -hmm. took us three years to build. And we use it for the main variable marketplace, but also with the development of the new NFT use cases, we're seeing that this model that one marketplace fits all stops working. Creators come, they develop their collection, they host the primary mint on their own, usually on their own website, and then they send people away to some marketplace and say, okay, now trade secondary there. This is a huge loss of users. You're just yeah. sending your people away. Uh, why would you do that? And also they come to this big marketplace and they say, oh, I actually can't find your product there. Or I, I found a copy of your product. That's a scam. So what we, what we discovered is that there is a big demand in the space to have vertical marketplaces that will be specifically tailor, tailored for this producer. We have... Pixel Vault Marketplace, for example, they have 30 collections of different comics issues categorized by year, categorized by the uh, lore, by the by the uh, universe uh, where the characters live. Some some of some of this category is their DAO items. So they need a custom explorer. They need the custom way to present these NFTs to their users and don't send people away. So that was one of the first use cases with our mm -hmm. marketplace that we built for other people that is outside of variable but based on the same tech and now officially yesterday we launched the product which is called variable x variable multiplied many variables if you want to have your own variable go to x.variable.com and you can create your own marketplace either for free for one collection or if you want a bigger if you're an enterprise you can come to us talk to our sales team and we will build your marketplace there's already five thousand marketplaces built with that tech Many of them are enterprises that we've, built, we've been working closely with. And that is actually the fastest growing part of our business today. Now, if I may ask you, like, I, I, I don't know if it's confidential or it's public information, but what is the range of pricing to create your own marketplace with Rarible X, right? You, you don't have to tell exactly the price, but at least like the range and the parameters which it depend on. Yeah. Um, I would say that... This is this heavily depends on how custom you want things to be. Mm -hmm. And for something fairly standard, that would be five figures. For something custom, that would be six figures. That's pretty much the range that they can guide yeah. you. And what is the timeline? How long does it take you from the moment that, let's say, 
uh, as a company, I come to you and I submit an application. Your representative contacts me. You get all the parameters, like you know, you analyze all the details, the partnership side, the paperwork. From there, how long does it take to actually deploy your custom marketplace? I think the the shortest we did is like one week, uh, oh, wow. but <laughs> that's uh, tough. So we usually want like three, four weeks of time uh, for something fairly standard. Mm -hmm. And the longest was several months. Got it. Like two, three now, months. Now, now you, you've posted like success stories, which is Mattel, McFarlane, like Animoca brands, and I'm sure there are many others, right? Can you guide us a little bit like, you know, what are, why, why for them, it was so important to use Rarible X as a, so to speak, white label solution? Why wouldn't they go and build something on their own? What's the benefits of working with you guys? Uh, benefits are quite simple. The three more, the three core value propositions is it's fast to up and get up and running with the best tech that Variable has. The second one is you don't send people away. You own the consumer experience on the full cycle, starting from there is announcement of the drop, people sign up, people leave emails on the day of the drop, there is an email call, okay, go mint it. Then to the secondary market, okay, now you can you can trade there. Most of these brands are asking us to build in some kind of uh, easier to understand wallet than just MetaMask and also the credit card on-ramp and off-ramp. So they're getting the full package completely hosted on their own domain with 30 collections, with 20 collections, that is digestible for people that follows their brand guidelines and the biggest one is it generates revenue for them right they drop items they earn money with mcfarlane we did a million dollar gmv gmv stands for gross merchandise value um it is total amount of sales so that's pretty hefty revenue for the company and for Mattel, there's like 3.7 million of uh, GMV to across primary and secondary market. So this is great revenue generating businesses for these companies. So let, let me ask you differently before we jump into like, you know, the last topic. Uh, obviously, McFarlane and Mattel, like, you know, they also have like traditional business line, right? You know, which is toys also, right? So mm -hmm. in your experience, um what is the future of fidgetals and for someone who doesn't know fidgetals is a combination when you own an nft and you can have a physical object linked to it or vice versa right so um because sometimes you know the criticism i've heard from the people who are still new they buy they're buying something that is purely digital and it's a collective uh, collection item which is an amazing right but for, some people are still missing this element okay Wait, can I have at least something like physical link to it? So therefore the question. Yes, we're seeing these two worlds blend together massively. Uh, we're seeing budget toys that went to every market, every Walmart in the United States uh, with their collection of toys, of just physical toys. And they are attaching the digital copy of that. And the digital copy for budget toys is non-transferable. You can trade it. So you buy a physical toy and you get a digital uh, item that you can tr transfer. So I think the future of digitals is solving the core issue. The digital blend has core issue. So once you deliver it, a physical item to the person and the digital item, they can start living two separate lives. So mm -hmm. the digital item can be sold separately and physical items can be sold separately. And there is no way to link that things that are already delivered. So you're either delivering physical toy and you're making digital item non-transferable or you keep the physical toy or physical item in stash and you deliver only digital and then this digital item can be traded back and forth multiple times and then any of the owners can request the physical toy to be delivered to them but in that moment the virtual gets non-transferable -trans or it gets burned and this is the stock x model if you if you've been ever uh trying to buy collectible sneakers mm -hmm. 
website where you can go, you can buy your sneakers, you can trade them 10 times when they appreciate in price. And then at some point you can say, okay, now I want my toys and you can't trade them anymore. Yes. That's the future. I think it's a very, very bright future. And I, I agree with you. It's still so underappreciated. There's so much like digital demand there. Like it's just like we had the first like two cycles, so to speak, not even full two cycles. And it's very early. Uh, from a lot of research papers I've read, uh, as in tokens, we had like much more. So you need like two, like four real cycles so that the market will establish itself. Right. And um, before, you know, like, you know, the the question that I want, I'm asking, like also without notification, right, which is the coolest question at the end, I'm keeping it for for the for the cherry on top. I want to ask you, maybe there are some advices that you would give for people who are still excited about NFTs, who want to explore more. Maybe there are ways how to partner with you guys, right? Or, or how to explore something like completely unique you would advise? So you can partner with us on making a drop with our new section, obviously. You can partner with us on creating a marketplace. We are super open for anybody who has crazy ideas about innovation. Like, let's do something some, that somebody didn't do before. Let's do token bound. Let's do NFTs that own other NFTs. Let's do bonding curve NFT friend tech style, if you understand what I mean uh, by saying all these words. Um, but advice general on the market is understand if you're going for it for speculation to make more money than you put in, or if you're just spending money, that's important because sometimes that can blend. You can buy something, you can get lured into buying something by, oh, you will resell it, but in reality, you won't be able to resell it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's going to be pretty sad. So if you want to get into for the speculation, there is a lot of cool collections that are turning into the IP route that will be almost revenue generating at some point. So you can buy pretty affordable prices right now, the NFT market is picking up. Or if you want to see cool stuff, I would recommend you just to go discover some free means, just art on layer twos, buy some cool stuff that you want to own and just enjoy it. And don't worry. Yeah. Also, probably the last one is Get on Farcaster, get on Lens, get on all the social media. Web3 is going to be big next bull run. That's that's a good a good advice. Um, last question, which is the question, which I never notify my guests, and I think that's the best part because your answer will be very sincere. Um, we do what we do for a reason, right? And you had this amazing journey, a very um, interesting entrepreneurial journey, right? But you're also a human being who lives on a deeper level, so like of different like um, you know meanings. So my question to you, Alex, is what's the meaning of life to you? Meaning of life to me. Yes. Yeah, I probably won't be original by saying that you coming up with your own meaning for life. Right, so there is there is no inherent meaning of life. Okay, there is several things you have to do. Right, you have to sustain yourself. You have to feed yourself. You have to reproduce. Uh, maybe not have to, but that's fairly common for all the people. You, <laughs> <laughs> but aside from that, it's just it's your life. You have only one of them. I find the big drive and just the personal growth. I want I want to do great stuff. I want to do big stuff. I want to grow uh, over myself. I, I made all this way from a small village in, in Russia uh, to New York. That drives me a lot. Um, I'm super excited for all the things. So pretty much, yeah, very standard overachieving, right? That works for me. I love it. Uh, it brings meaning to my life. So constant progress, if I were to summarize it. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Okay. Beautiful. Um, listen, we're both in New York. We're definitely gonna meet, I'm sure, in a lot of other like events, you know, here and um excited about your journey. Really congrats with the four year anniversary, congrats with your new product. Like um anyone who's watching here, where they can find you, where where do you spend more time? LinkedIn, Twitter, friend tech. <laughs> 
Um, LinkedIn is no way probably zero chance i'm answering there there's too too much things I, i'm not on top of them twitter is where i spend most of my time but it's also pretty busy uh forecaster would be a great new platform where is the high chance that i'm gonna see your message uh but mostly is twitter it's insider zero x on twitter mm, find me there follow variable variable often repost my posts Mm, you can find me through Rarebo as well. Yeah, that would be it. Perfect. I think that's that's an amazing summary. We're definitely going to share all the links and feel free to ask Alex questions. Uh, he's very responsive. You heard it. Like whether you call it twitterx.com, doesn't matter. You're going to find him there and you can bombard him with all the NFT questions, right? <laughs> so, and in his due time, that's his hobby. He's replying, like, you know, all the questions. Uh, thank you so much, Alex. I think what you build together with your team is amazing. Is truly a great example of pro, like of resilience and tenacity, right? And um, the good thing you still have this, you know, zeal, this like passion to continue, right? You know, I think that is even more important so than what you have achieved till now. Uh, and anyone who's exploring Rarible only now, go to rarible.com you know, buy your first NFT or mint your first NFT, explore it, and then you're going to leave feedback under the comments. Thank you so much, Alex, and I'm, I'm hope we can do it again. Thank you, Konstantin. Super grateful to you to have me here. This is all super, super cool. Thank you.